<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. From the wreckage of Hellenistic historiography, only Polybius survives in large part, and even he did not get through the storm unscathed. His fragmentary text has hampered efforts to trace consistent lines of interpretation and thematic reinforcement. This is no doubt one of the reasons that the shift from historical to literary and historiographical criticism, so characteristic of treatments of Herodotus and Thucydides in the last 30 years, has only recently begun to touch Polybius. But of course, there are others. Uh, although Wallbank's great commentary consistently treats historiographical and somewhat less often literary matters, the brusque and pragmatic manner of Polybius seems to have guided most scholars in the direction where Polybius himself felt that he was most competent. The historian's apparent disdain for literary artifice and his insistent concern with the business of history may have distracted attention from his careful structuring of events and his consistent invocation of principles of common culture. Yet this achievement is visible even in the patchwork of quotations that make up the standard texts of his work. Indeed, it is perhaps the finest testimony to Polybius's achievement that despite the loss of most and the most important part of his history. He is ranked by moderns as one of antiquity's great historians. Nevertheless, the treatment of him and his work in, uh, in this lecture must reflect both the nature of the evidence presented by his text, as well as the slow movement by scholars towards new interpretations of Polybius. Polybius was born around 200 BC, in Megalopolis, a member of the Achaean League, a federation of cities centered in the north and central Peloponnese. Earlier dissolved, the League was revived in the year 281-280, and from the mid-3rd century onward grew rapidly. Under the, le the leadership of Aratus of Sicyon, it became a dominant player in Greek affairs, and thereafter Philippimen, the great leader from Megalopolis, extended a keen influence over the whole of the Peloponnese. The young Polybius was steeped in the affairs of this league. His father, Lycortus, was Philippimen's close friend and political ally, and Polybius carried the great man's ashes in his funeral procession in the year 182 BC, and later wrote a biography of him. Like his father, Polybius held high office in the Achaean League, serving as its cavalry commander in the year 170-169. This was a difficult time for the Achaeans, since they were trying simultaneously to support the Romans and also to maintain independence in their own affairs. In the machinations that followed the Roman defeat of Perseus of Macedon in the year 169, Polybius's fellow Achaean Callicrates went to Rome where he inveighed against those Greeks who cared too little for Rome's interests. He provided for the Romans the names of Achaeans who were supposedly guilty of such neglect, and Polybius was included in this list of approximately 1,000 men. The Achaeans were deported to Italy and stationed throughout the peninsula, but by the interventions of Quintus Fabius Maximus Aemilianus and Scipio Aemilianus, the sons of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, Polybius was allowed to remain in Rome. We will never know whether the move to Rome made Polybius a historian or whether he was uh, one already. But certainly having chosen to become the chronicler of Rome's rise to power, it is likely that a man of such energy felt greatly constrained and the decision to write history may have seemed a partial amelioration for the loss of active political participation. However that may be, his proximity to the people who decided the major issues of the day could not help him but learn and understand. In 150 BC, the Achaean exiles were finally permitted to go home, and Polybius duly returned to Megalopolis. In the next year, however, the consul Manius Manilius requested that Polybius be sent to him as an advisor in the coming war against Carthage. Polybius says that he got as far as Corsaira, 
when he turned back under the impression, mistaken as it happened to be, that the war had been resolved by diplomatic means. In the following years, disaster struck. The Achaean League quarreled with Rome over the secession of Sparta from the Federation, and matters deteriorated to such a point that the Romans declared war on the League and, of course, were quickly victorious. This occurred in the year 146 BC. Polybius arrived back in Achaea immediately after the destruction of Corinth that year, and the Romans chose him to put matters in order both in and between certain cities. For his actions, he was rewarded, Pausanias tells us, with honorific inscriptions at Megalopolis and Akakisium. The date of his death is unknown, but one source tells us that he died in a fall from a horse at the age of 82. Polybius's friendship with the sons of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, especially Scipio Aemilianus, was of decisive importance. From this friendship and from his association with them, he was privy to many of the actions in Rome, including reports of the deliberations of the Senate. Amongst other things, Polybius accompanied Aemilianus to Spain in the year 151-150 and to North Africa, where he met Massinissa and learned from him details of the final battles of the Second Punic War. Polybius tells us that he was present at the destruction of Carthage in 146 BC, and he narrates the famous incident there in which Scipio Aemilianus turned to him in tears and quoted lines from Homer's Iliad, uh, watching Carthage fall, I know that one day Ilion will fall, and the people of Ilion and of Priam of the goodly ash spear. Just before or after this, Polybius had used a ship lent him by Emilianus to explore the coasts of Africa and Spain, information which he was able to put to good use in his geographical observations throughout his histories. Also, while at Rome, Polybius took an active hand in some events, as when, for example, he assisted Demetrius of Syria in his escape from Italy and return home. Therefore, for Polybius, as for no other historian, we have attested a wealth of political, diplomatic, and military achievement. He was close to the centers of power, and, like Thucydides, he was of an age and disposition to learn. Unlike his predecessor, however, Polybius's political and military experience was lifelong, and it is perhaps not surprising, therefore, that he, more than any other historian of antiquity, demanded political activity and experience by the historian himself if he was to compose a work of any use for contemporaries and posterity. Not surprisingly, Polybius envisions his primary audience as men of affairs, political and military men, who will derive great benefit from his history. It is clear that he is writing especially for Greeks, and he occasionally makes the explicit claim that he will need to learn from, I'm sorry, that they will need to learn from the events that he recounts. He says this, for instance, in Book 1, uh, 3, 3 through 8, and Book 2, 35, 9. But he also states that the Romans too will read his history, since it contains the greatest number of their deeds. This he says in Book 31, 22, 8. There is no need, however, to limit his work exclusively to these two groups, for it is clear from the preface that many can benefit from his work, specifically from looking at the vicissitudes attendant upon mankind in general, since, quote, the remembrance of other people's calamities is the most vivid and indeed the most, the only instructor of how to bear nobly the vicissitudes of fortune, end quote. This is, he says in Book 1, 1, 1 through 2. And this idea of improvement, uh, of instruction, of correction, the orthosis, the orthosis, um, this idea brought about by history thus consists of two parts. It is a practical knowledge, of the way the political world works, and a moral education in the way the larger metaphysical world works. The latter, of course, allows Polybius to present his history as universal, since through history, readers can learn to accept and understand the successes and failures of human life. 
The histories of Polybius comprised 40 books, covering events from 264 through 146. However, what has come down to us is but a meager portion of the original. Only the first five books survive completely, while the remaining 35 are known only from fragments. Most of these come from the work known as the Excerpa Antiqua, which covers books 1 through 18, or from a work known as the Constantinian Excerpts, a series of extracts of ancient historians commissioned by the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus, who ruled from 913 to 959 AD. Uh, and these are arranged by topic. These contained many passages from Polybius, but as most excerpts come from his work on embassies and on virtues and vices, our knowledge of the later books is skewed towards diplomatic history and character evaluation. With Polybius, as with Livy, what survives is not necessarily what we would have wanted. The opening two books are, by the author's own account, based on the work of others, and his narrative of the Hannibalic War, that is the war against Hannibal, is only beginning when the text is lost. The later books, which contain the truly contemporary history that Polybius had witnessed and taken part in, would have been invaluable in their complete state. For his main subject, the how and when and why of Roman control of the Mediterranean, Polybius decided to begin with what is what he refers to as the 140th Olympia. This would be the years 220 to 217 BC. Because it was then, he says, that a true interweaving or sum ploque of events began. To this, however, he affixes a prefatory account, pro catascoe, comprising books one and two, which surveys the events of the First Punic War, the Carthaginian Mercenary War, Carthaginian activity in Spain, Rome's encounters with Illyria, and the Gauls and events in Greece, particularly the rise of the Achaean League and the war with King Cleomenes of Sparta. He justifies this procedure by claiming it is necessary for his readers to understand the background to the events he will be describing. This he says in Book 1, 3, 8 through 9. There are historiographical reasons for this extended preface as well. It places Polybius in a tradition with Herodotus and Thucydides. Uh, the former had begun with a series of abductions, you will recall, that were then dismissed by beginning at an accurate historical point, while the latter used his account of early Greece to support his argument for the greatness of his war, and not coincidentally to display the superiority of his method. Polybius, however, has taken this type of extended preface to greater heights, for neither of those historians worked on such a scale, and a closer model may be Timaeus's history, much more on him in a moment. No doubt Polybius considered such a treatment justified by the size of his history, far greater than either Herodotus or Thucydides's, and the magnitude of his subject, a magnitude visible especially in the number of theaters embraced by the work. This prefatory account also allows Polybius to display his superior method by bettering the accounts of his sources, Fabius Pictor and Philinus. In addition, the move back to the year 264 allows Polybius to join his history with that of Timaeus, his most important successor, who concluded his work in that year. Uh, that is, he, he concluded his narration of events in that, uh, 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 from that year. So Polybius' 50-year period mimics Thucydides' Pentacont Aetia, the digression employed in Book I, which, not coincidentally, joined Thucydides' work to the last point of Herodotus' narrative. Most importantly of all, though, it, uh, this extended preface allows Polybius to draw out for his readers the individual backgrounds that are soon to be united by Tuche, fortune, and by Roman might. Given his intense concern with establishing a clear evaluation of beginnings and causes, it is not surprising that Polybius should want to bring everything into a certain order and perspective. 
Having chosen the moment of fortune's unification for the, his beginning, Polybius was then left with the decision where to end, and he here seems to have changed his mind. In Book One, he suggests that his subject will be the scarcely 53 years of Rome's command of the Mediterranean. Since his starting point is 220, the end must have been the Battle of Pydna in 168. A fitting point, since it marked the defeat of Perseus and the end of Macedonian monarchy. But in the preface from Book Three, Polybius, while reiterating the 53 year, uh, um, delineation, says that he will also treat the manner in which Rome ruled once she had achieved her domination, giving an account of the, quote, subsequent policy of the conquerors and their method of universal rule, as well as the various opinions and appreciations of their rulers entertained by the subjects, end quote. This from Book 3, 4, 6. To do this, he added some 20 years in eight books. This is books, uh, these are books 31 through 33, and then again 35 through 39, ending in the year 146 with a decisive, if depressing, conclusive conclusion to the work that is the destruction of Carthage and Corinth, two great cultural centers on either end, basically, of the Mediterranean in the same year of 146. The latter part of this period marks what he calls a period of upheaval and disturbance, kinesis kai tarrake, two terms that are also historiographically significant. Thucydides had called the Peloponnesian War the greatest upheaval uh, of all, that, uh, that, and kinesis is the word he uses there, book one, chapter one, two, and Xenophon, in his Hellenica, had called the time after Mantinea one of still greater disturbance, Tarache. This is in Xenophon's Hellenica, Book 7, Chapter 5, 27. Polybius also says that his decision to add these years was motivated by the fact that he himself had taken a large part in events of that time. Indeed, from the surviving fragments at least, he does seem to have loomed large as a historical participant. Thus, the added portion seems to have several justifications, from the evaluation of Roman rule to the noteworthy nature of the events themselves to the glorification of the historian. With Book 3, Polybius began his narrative proper, and Books 3 through 5 treated the early years of the Hannibalic War, that is the war with Hannibal, stopping in 216 in the aftermath of the Battle of Cannae, in Book 6, Polybius gave a full treatment of the Roman politeia, not only the constitutional workings, but also the disposition of the military and even its social mores, as seen, for example, in his well-known account of the Roman funeral in Book 6, 53 through 55. Books 7 through 11 treated events from the years 216 to 207, stopping right before Scipio's campaigns in Africa. Book 12 was a digression consisting of polemic with other historians, especially Timaeus, and detailing Polybius's beliefs about the proper way of writing history. A further three books, that is books 13 through 15, then brought the Second Punic War to an end, the focus then moved largely to the east with the Second Macedonian War from the years 200 to 196, ending with Book 18 and Books 19 through 21 continued this focus, now dealing largely with events arising out of Rome's war with Antiochus the Great from the years 192 to 189. Events from 188 to 169 took up Books 22 through 29, uh, I'm sorry, 22 through 39. Uh, the last, no, I'm sorry, 22 through 29. Uh, the last three in this series focusing on the war with Perseus uh, from the years 172 through 169. And books 30 through 33 <clears throat> covered events from the years 168 to 53, while book four, uh, 34 was devoted solely to geography. The final five books, that is books uh, 35 to 39, treated uh, a mere seven years, 
from the years 152 to 146, while Book 40 contained an index. This distribution of material, to the extent that it can be recovered from the fragments, was to assign normally two books to each Olympiad, that is, period of four years. Where events were sparse, however, it was not uncommon to treat an entire Olympiad in one book. And conversely, when great wars or conflicts arose, the scale of treatment expanded. Some years, for example, each of the last two uh, years of the Hannibalic War and the fateful year of 146 to 145, they got a separate book for themselves. The arrangement within Olympiads was also strictly followed from Book 7 onwards. Here Polybius began to make his narrative reflect what he claimed fortune had done with history, that is, interweave events towards one and the same end. He therefore followed a strict order of narration, breaking from it only rarely. For each Olympiad he began with events in Italy, then moved to Sicily, Spain, Africa, then eastwards to Greece and Macedonia, and concluded with Asia and Egypt. Polybius notes that this arrangement occasionally causes problems, especially in those cases, quote, where, according to the general scheme of my work and the order imposed on my narrative, the locality which was the scene of the final catastrophe occupies an earlier place than that which witnessed the initial stages, end quote, from Book 15, 24a. The historian does not propose a solution to such a problem, which seems to have occurred fairly often, other than to inform his reader that he is aware of it. He clearly thought his method had more benefits than drawbacks. However, he seems to have anticipated complaints on the part of his readers about the arrangement himself, since in Book 38, he addresses the issue specifically by an appeal both to nature and to his predecessors. The argument from nature is that our senses are easily sated by similar things and prefer variety and even interruption. We do not like to listen to the same strain of music, nor to eat the same food always. And if the senses are captivated by change, how much more so must the mind be? It was for this reason, he concludes, that the most renowned of ancient writers use digressions. But Polybius is superior in that they use uh, in that they use digressions irregularly, while he adheres to his movements from place to place in a regular and fixed order, so that his readers may easily recall where he broke off and thus have pleasure and instruction. This he also explains in Book Thirty Eight Five Through Six. With that, now we may now turn to the subject matter itself. To say that Polybius's subject is the rise of Rome to power is not quite accurate, for, as I have mentioned earlier, he adds another part in which Rome is already the ruling power. It would be fairer to say, therefore, that he that the finished work must have covered how Rome rose and then how Rome ruled. He claims that his work is a universal history, an ambiguous term in antiquity, as now. Ephorus, of course, can lay claim to being the first universal historian, in space as in time, treating those nations with which the Greeks came into contact, and taking the story from its beginnings down to his own time. But Polybius's history is universal not only because it treats the entire oikumene, that is, the entire inhabited world, by which is meant the Mediterranean, but also and especially because affairs during his lifetime moved to one end, pros hentelos, by arguing such Polybius was able to claim that his subject was a single unified one and that his own history accurately mirrored the events. For just as Rome subsumed individual nations, so Polybius's history subsumed all other forms of history. In addition to universal history, Polybius claims to be writing pragmatique historia, pragmatic history, a term that has been much discussed by scholars. The clearest indication of what this type of history entails comes at the beginning of Book 9, where the historian admits that his work may be less pleasing because he has not, like so many other historians, combined the different types, mere, of history, namely, one, genealogical accounts, 
Two, accounts of colonies, foundations of cities and family histories. And three, deeds of nations and cities and rulers. Roxeston ethnon kai poleon kai dunaston. Rather, he has confined his attention strictly to the last. Pragmatic history is therefore the history of praxis, specifically the deeds that come after the earlier or mythical time periods and can be considered truly historical. These deeds, of course, are the political and military doings of states, those things that are worthy of record. And to this extent, Polybius is in a direct line with both Herodotus and Thucydides. Yet his orientation and focus are significantly different from either of these. Because to begin with, Polybius noted in his preface that his readers would want to know not only how, but also with what form of politeia the Romans conquered the known world. The interest in constitutions can be traced back to Aristotle and his school, but Polybius seems to have in mind not just the political order, but the whole organization of state, that is, how it assigns responsibility and ensures order. In Book 6, for example, he discusses the various offices of state and the responsibilities of senate and people. But he also had a large passage on the arrangement of the Roman army, in a description of the funerals of Roman statesmen. Like Herodotus explaining Persian or Egyptian customs, Polybius is extremely interested in how the Romans conducted themselves and at times points up the excellence of one or another procedure or custom that they have. He says, quote, But on this occasion, <clears throat> But on this occasion, and often on previous ones, it is the difference in their customs, heton ethismon diaphora, that has saved Roman affairs. For with them, death is the penalty incurred for a man who deserts his post or takes flight in any way. Polybius is interested in what Rome's institutional strengths were that allowed her to win out in the end. So like Herodotus, but in a much more pragmatic way, he was looking for answers that could not be found on the battlefield. Two subjects to which Polybius devoted extensive treatment in his histories were tactics and geography. Neither is perhaps surprising, since Polybius also wrote works on tactics and on the parts of the globe under the equator. More importantly for the histories, both are considered essential to the man of affairs. Unlike Thucydides, who can be fairly vague about the details of battles, Polybius narrates them with precision and palpable interest, whether it be the specifics of the stationing of troops, the proper use of cavalry, or his concern with the use of mercenaries. But that is not all. He likewise gives a great deal of space to the practical aspects of generalship, not only the general's leadership of his soldiers, but also in the knowledge that the good general is expected to, uh, but, but also uh, in, in the knowledge that a good general is expected to have. Since strategy counts more than force, the effective leader must have an eye for the proper mo moment. He must know topography. He must even know something of astronomy so as to calculate time correctly both day and night and at different times of the year. Many a disaster, Polybius warns, has come about from a failure of the proper coordination. In another passage, he gives a lengthy lesson in how to use fire signals. His interest in geography was such that he devoted an entire book, that would be book 34, to its elucidation. Even before the, this book, however, Polybius includes numerous geographical excursions throughout the narrative. He states, as the purpose of these, the need to put before the readers' eyes the sight of the historical react, uh, actions, especially as geography often plays a role in how battles develop or in how troops must be deployed and maneuvered. This is clearly a more utilitarian role for geography than one finds in, say, Herodotus or Thucydides. Indeed, Polybius, Polybius claims that geography is one of the three parts of pragmatic history. And as I've already said, it is also the skill necessary for the effective general. As to that separate book entirely devoted to, to geography, Book 34, 
Polybius may here have been following in the footsteps of Ephorus, who devoted two separate books to the subject of geography in his universal history. The fragments indicate both that the range of places dealt with was large and that Polybius spoke also of the lands themselves, including their native characteristics and resources. He also staunchly defended Homeric geography against Eratosthenes and similar, quote, detractors, and by a process of rationalization sought to save much of the information in Homer. Even here, of course, he betrays his pragmatic approach by arguing that Homer's poetry and other poetry as well would lack utility if everything in it were simply invented. The study of Polybius's narrative manner is hampered by the loss of the major part of his work. It is true that we have five continuous books, but the first two are, as I've already noted by the author's own acknowledgement, a brief survey of matters before his main subject proper. The next three books certainly are valuable for determining some aspects of his method, but we would dearly like to have had the books that approached his own times, and especially the books that dealt with Rome's incursion into the East. Even aside from this, it might not seem a promising avenue of inquiry, since Polybius is clear that he does not consider style and language to be amongst the most important aspects of the writing of history. He is suspicious of highly adorned narratives and of historians, such as Zeno of Rhodes, who put too much effort into such aspects. Polybius more explicitly addresses the issue in a comparison of his method with that of those who write monographs. Whereas they are compelled to magnify events and linger in detail over each matter, he, as a universal historian, gives briefer and true accounts. He asks for pardon, quote, if I appear to be using the same arguments, the same disposition of material, and the same modes of speech as on a previous occasion. This is clearly a rejection of the rhetorical teaching that one should say old things in a new way. When we look at Polybius's narrative manner, we note a fairly strong disjunction and this is the case even in the fragments. On the one hand, a mimetic narrative of the events with consistent use of speeches, focalization, and the like, but on the other hand, a prominent and intrusive narrator who often interrupts the narrative in order to comment on his own account, whether that be praise, censure, interpretation, exhortation, or the like. These interpretations can be lengthy digressions, an entire book, for instance, exists on the failings of Timaeus and the uh, proper way to write history, or a few words to indicate that the teacher is never far from the scene. For an example of the latter, we can note Polybius's remark in the midst of his narrative in, uh, of the Battle of Trebia, where Hannibal, quote, took the view that a decisive engagement should never be undertaken on any chance pretext and without a definitive purpose, the very thing which it must be said is the work of a good general, and made the men in retreat halt and face about when they approached the camp, end quote. Even in what seems small matters, Polybius did not lose sight of his didactic purpose and did not wish to leave to the reader the proper interpretation of events. If we compare this manner with that of, say, Thucydides or even Herodotus, we can see the difference at once, where the, their narratives are dialogic and require the reader's efforts in interpretation. Polybius's history, it seems, needs only the attention of the student to the teacher's instruction, where those earlier historians spoke eloquently a by their arrangement and disposition of material, Polybius chose to speak in his own person. Now, Polybius sees himself as writing not only pragmatic history, but also what he calls apodictic history, apodictice historia. This term and its related expressions refer to Polybius's detailed manner of giving causes and attendant circumstances, the how, when, and why, in his narration. Yet there is something too of Herodotus, Histories Apodexis, the, uh, this was his, uh, you know, the demonstration of history that uh, Herodotus begins his work with, that phrase, 
there is something of this in that in Polybius, in that Polybius consistently calls attention to the work he is doing on the reader's behalf, on the role he himself plays in the fashioning of the history. It is important to note that neither the choice of pragmatic nor that of apodictic history require the narrative manner that we find in Polybius. What we have is manifestly the way Polybius thought history should be written. Polybius seems to have used digressions on a scale not seen since Herodotus. Yet, whereas earlier historians may have employed them as places of refreshment for the reader, Polybius assigned them a primarily didactic purpose. The important qualities of a general, the danger of employing mercenaries, the way character is affected by fortune, the proper way to write history, and so forth. It may be that since Polybius felt his constant changes of scene lent the work a variety and refreshment, he could then harness the digression to his uh, didactic purposes. Nonetheless, if we concentrate on the mimetic portions of the narrative, we can see that Polybius is not without skill. One of his strengths as a narrator is his use of focalization. For instance, in his narrative of the First Punic War, he consistently shows the activities of both the Romans and the Carthaginians, treating their planning, training, and reactions to victory and defeat. So too, in the immediately following narrative of the Mercenary War, this is Book 1, 65 through 88, one of the few places that this ability seems to desert him is in his narrative of the Achaean League's conflicts with the other states of the Peloponnese. In this narrative, the main focalizers are the Achaeans and their leaders, with only very short shrift given to the Aetolians and to Cleomenes. Here, clearly, his own political views and axes to grind have gotten in the way of a balanced account. Polybius is careful to portray events not only from both sides, but also in a way that indicates the historical participants' actual experience of events. How, as the scholar Davidson has shown, uh, so much depends on the way the characters look at certain actions and how their perceptions closely inform their actions and reactions. The emphasis on the visual vividness, the uh, energia, uh, that which which is lent to the narrative, um, as with Thucyd Thucydides, is not simply for effect or for entertainment, but rather Polybius concentrates on how the perceived realities of different situations contribute materially to the advancement of or failure of one's cause. Lagoras of, of Crete knows that Sardis is considered impregnable, and so he gives his special attention to taking it, assuming that success will have the effect of shock on his enemies. Similarly, Aemilius Paulus decides to attack Dimele since there was a, quote, general belief that it was impregnable, end quote. To capture it, therefore, would strike fear into the neighboring towns. In the same way, Philip takes Ar Archelissus because of the defender's belief in its unassailability. In each case, again, as the scholar Davidson has pointed out, the places taken have little strategic value. Instead, the success of seizing them gives an appearance of invincibility to the successful conqueror. Therefore, on the one level, military action is reduced to the status of signifier, becoming meaningful only for what it says about something else, about the invisible qualities of the participants. At moments of great importance, Polybius is not averse to raising the emotions. It is sometimes said that Polybius saw attempts to raise emotions as alien to the sober, pragmatic history that he so wished to write, but this is not quite correct. It is true that Polybius has no time for frivolous writers who strive after emotional effect purely for entertainment value, but as with everything in Polybius, when this kind of emotional quality is directed towards the right aim, that is the didactic function of history, it is legitimate to use and therefore he does so. Polybius's attack on Philarchus is generally seen as a ruthless assault on emotionally highly charged history. 
And to a certain extent, that is true. Yet a careful reading of that polemic shows that Philarchus's error was not in trying to raise the emotions per se, but rather in trying to do so for a set of circumstances that did not warrant it. And that is why Polybius must argue that the sufferings of the Mantineans arose from their own evil deeds, and they are not deserving of our pity. The proper appreciation of truly great deeds, on the other hand, is not without its emotional component, and Polybius assumes that the spectacle of events will affect the reader. He says, who could fail to be moved in reading the narrative of such matters? Uh, he asks this before his account of the final battle of Zama in the Hannibalic War. Indeed, in his narrative of this battle, Polybius was not at all averse to constructing a highly emotional narrative, complete with descriptions of confusion, panic, shouts, laments, and horror as the soldiers make their way amongst the corpses on the battlefield. When Polybius narrated the fall of Carthage and Corinth, it is clear that he did indeed seek to raise the emotions on behalf of the defeated. In the case of Carthage, Polybius depicted a highly emotional scene in which the wife of Hasdrubal, after reproaching him for trying to save himself alone, killed both herself and their children. The onlookers, Polybius notes, were moved by the family's change of fortune, just as no doubt the reader is also supposed to be. And not only for the defeated, Scipio's tears at the fall of the city of Carthage indicate the emotional involvement uh, involved and that it was something hardly to be avoided. On the contrary, his recognition of the mutability of fortune at the greatest triumph of his life recommends him to the reader as a man worthy of memory. The reader's involvement in the deeds that Polybius uh, recounts is therefore an incitement to behave similarly, and Polybius sees this as an important part of his work. It is worthwhile also to note Polybius's attitude toward speeches. As to be expected, Polybius makes several methodological remarks about the use of speeches, particularly in polemic with other historians. The historian should not, he says, be like the poets who seek out all the occasions of speech, but rather should record the words and deeds in accordance with truth, even if they happen to be quite ordinary. For as with deeds, so with words, the historian's task is to discover what actually took place. Timaeus, for example, did not set down what was actually said, nor even the sense of it, but rather invented false speeches to show off his verbal skill. Moreover, his attempts were ludicrous, full of schoolroom clichés and sentiments unworthy of the speakers. On the other hand, Polybius's principles are not to include speeches on every possible occasion, nor to give for every speech that is included all the arguments actually made at the time. He says this quite explicitly, quote, for the truth is that occasions are, uh, for, for the truth is that occasions are, which um, exist, which admit of all, sorry, for the truth is that occasions are rare, typo, which admit of all possible arguments being set forth. As a rule, the circumstances of the case confine them to narrow limits, and of such speeches some are regarded with favor by men of our time, another by those of an earlier age. Different styles, again, are popular with Aetolians, Peloponnesians, and Athenians. But to make digressions point by point for the purpose of setting forth every possible speech that could be made, as Timaeus does, is utterly misleading, pedantic, and worthy of a schoolroom essayist. The historian then must select from among the arguments those that are most persuasive. And Polybius elsewhere says that his practice is to include only the most vital and effectual. As with the writing of deeds, so with speeches, one must, of course, select the proper language, although Polybius excuses himself if he sometimes uses the same style and words. Nonetheless, as his remark about speeches makes clear, Polybius recognized the criterion of appropriateness for different speakers and di uh, different times. It is precisely this lack of appropriateness that made Timaeus give to statesmen speeches that were utterly unworthy of them. However, since Polybius is well aware that many arguments are made on each occasion and the historian must select, he needs to establish a principle for the inclusion of speeches. 
He does this, not surprisingly, in his polemic with Timaeus, using that historian's failings as illumination for Polybius's own virtues. As there is no fixed rule to decide the quantity and quality of the words to be used on a particular occasion, great care and training are required if we are to instruct and not mislead our readers. This may be brought home to the mind by means of systematic demonstration founded on personal and habitual experience. That last part, ec ectes autopatheas kai tribes theorematon. Here, too, Polybius decides that for an effective history that is to be beneficial to men of affairs, the historian must himself have taken part in public life so that life may help art to imitate life. In several cases, Polybius mentions that a speech was given but does not reveal its contents, either because there was nothing worthy of mention, he says this in Book 5, 103.8, or there was nothing profitable that could be learned from the speech, as with that of the Smyrnaian representatives at Rome in the year 190. Uh, Smyrna, which was one of Rome's most loyal allies, were simply granted what they wished. This is in Book 21, 22, 4. At that same meaning of the Senate, however, the Rhodian and Pergamene speeches are given in detail because, as the great scholar Polybius Wallbank has pointed out, they illuminate contemporary divisions over the important issue of the freedom of the Greeks in Asia. How the speeches were arranged and distributed throughout the history, their total number, and the proportion of types, Polybius mentions three kinds, addresses to the people, harangues to soldiers, and speeches of ambassadors, this can no longer be established because we don't have so much of the text. Um, and we do not know how typical the excerpts are. In the surviving texts that we do have, there are about an equal number of deliberative and ambassador ambassadorial speeches and a slightly smaller number of addresses to troops. At times, as in Thucydides, there are paired speeches, although how common this was is uncertain. Because one of the surviving volumes of extracts concerned embassies, speeches of ambassadors loom large in the surviving fragments. Given Polybius's particular interests in the relations between the ruling power and the Greeks, however, these may in fact have loomed large in the history as a whole. They follow a certain general pattern, combining an appeal to history, usually to demonstrate one's consistency, and an argument in favor of self-interest. Perhaps not surprisingly, given Polybius's audience, the greatest number of speeches are by Greeks. These often argue from what is beneficial, and sometimes combine this with an appeal to justice. As with Thucydides, the question of the historicity of the speeches has been raised, but as with that earlier historian, so with Polybius, one cannot prove this one way or the other. It is generally assumed, for example, that the paired speeches of Hannibal and Publius Cornelius Scipio before the Battle of Tychinus, in which are recounted in Book 3, 63 through 4, are unhistorical. The speakers, to be sure, say what we would expect them to say. Hannibal says that they are fighting in a foreign country and have no refuge in defeat, and Scipio, for his part, says that they should be confident against the Carthaginians who have been subservient to them. Uh, it is noteworthy that Polybius then remarks that Scipio's troops were heartened, quote, on account of their trust in the man and the truth of the things said, Book 3, 64, 11. That the Romans go on to defeat uh, at the hands of the Carthaginians suggests that um, Scipio's words were invented, but rather, uh, I'm sorry, it suggests not that Scipio's words were invented, but rather that his observations were just um, simply what one would imagine. They were intelligible from the Roman point of view. However, circumstances showed that Scipio was overly confident, and that, uh, in fact, is part of the lesson to be learned there. In any case, there is no reason to think that Polybius considered the speeches to be other than historical, or that his version was not the substance of the speeches there. A, similarly, a similar controversy surrounds the speech of Agelaus of Naupactus, with its famous image of the storm clouds approaching from the west. The speech marks the point at which Polybius believed events throughout the Mediterranean began to be unified. 
and it has therefore been suspected that Polybius deliberately increased the importance of this incident by fashioning the speech in such a way so as to demonstrate the truth of Polybius's own interpretation of events. One argument raised against the historicity of the speeches is the repetition within them of themes or motifs or sentiments. Leon's speech to the Romans in 190-189 on behalf of the Aetolians compares the people to the sea in that they are calm except when roused up by some disruptive force. It made a particular impression on the audience, says Polybius. Yet the sentiment had been uttered by Scipio during a mutiny of his troops in the year 206. And there he had called it explicitly, quote, a thing agreed upon by all men, end quote. However, here it may be useful to uh, turn our attention to Polybius's own remark made in passing, that, quote, speeches, so to speak, sum up events and hold the history together, end quote. Therefore, continuity of themes in the speeches suggests, or at least it might suggest, that Polybius, in accord with his principles, selects from the speeches those arguments and sentiments that accord with his own view of history as usefulness. We are faced with the same situation as with Thucydides, the historian's speech, even if it contains pieces of an original speech, is nevertheless, because of the author's own arrangement, selection, style, and placement within a context, the historian's own. The speeches before that Battle of Zama that I've just referred to before are a good example of such practice. Here, Scipio is made to exhort his troops by suggesting that the coming battle would be, quote, for the undisputed sovereignty of the world, end quote. Now, he, that is Scipio, in a mirror image of Hannibal's earlier situation, tells his troops that there is no place for safety in defeat. Okay, that is an exact repetition of what Hannibal had said before the Battle of Tachinus, as reported by Polybius. And Hannibal, for his part, before the Battle of Zama, in a similar reversal to Publius Scipio's earlier situation, he tells his men to remember their many victories over the Romans and to keep before their eyes Trebia and Cannae. Whereas Scipio's speech here at Zama invests the events to come with a grand importance, the reversal of situations is meant to recall the persistent theme that runs throughout all of Polybius's work, and that is the mutability of fortune. With the same sense of importance, but by different means, the speeches of the Kleinians of Aetolia and Lysicus of Acarnania before the Spartan assembly bring before the reader's eyes the, as Polybius saw it, crucial moment when the Greek world was choosing between Philip and Rome. Both speakers argue using the historical exemplar that most benefit their side, and the speeches, which incidentally show the value for public men of studying history, recall the decisive events of earlier Peloponnesian history, leading to the present moment a sense of crucial importance and decisiveness. In this way, the speeches too contribute to the overall didactic purpose of Polybius's history, while allowing the author to give unity to his multifarious work by a reminder to his audience of the recurring important issues at stake. No surviving historian speaks of the writing of history in anything like the detail of Polybius, a fact all the more astounding when we consider that just a fraction of his work survives. In numerous passages throughout his work, he gives his opinions on both the proper and the incorrect way of writing history, as well as on past and contemporary historians. Taken together, and given the loss of the theoretical works that were written by Theophrastus and Varro, among others, the remarks of Polybius represent the most comprehensive analysis of ancient historiography that we possess. These remarks, as we would expect, are oriented towards Polybius's specific interests, and, of course, they serve to advance his own claims and aims. They emphasize the two aspects of Polybius's brand of history, pragmatic and apodictic, at its most typical, and the historian gets to indulge in his two favorite roles of expert and teacher. Many, if not the majority, of these remarks appear in passages of polemic with contemporary and earlier historians. The use of polemic had, of course, a long history 
in Greek literature, and it would have a, a continued history after Polybius. Um, and it was certainly not even confined to historiography, as, for instance, even a glance at the early philosophers of, of Greece shows. In a society that was built around competition, attacking one's opponent could have the same effect as praising oneself without the attendant bad will brought on by the latter. In addition, rhetoric sanctioned a hostile tone for polemic. One was expected, that is, to raise the emotions in such a setting, and thus the denunciations of historians and Polybius are often accompanied by sarcastic rhetorical questions and attacks on the character of his opponents. Polemic would also have been congenial to Polybius, since it was considered a useful teaching tool, in that one learned by seeing both the right and the wrong method of doing things. As I've already stated, Polybius claimed to be writing universal history, but it was of a certain sort, unified both in time and theme. Although he acknowledged Ephorus as a predecessor, he dismissed other unnamed contemporaries who claimed to be offering universal history, when in fact all they did was write a few lines in a brief and perfunctory manner. On the other hand, a real universal history, such as Polybius's, is superior to all others. It allows for a vision of the whole, whereas writers on individual wars contribute little to that vision. And one cannot, from their works, see the process of histor history entire. Universal history is eminently suited for, to the elucidation and analysis of causes, whereas writers of monographs cannot show, quote, the consequences of events, the concomitant circumstances, and above all, their causes, end quote. One cannot take a notion, en noyan, from a monograph, but not knowledge, I'm sorry, one can take a notion, an ennoia, from a monograph, but not knowledge or an accurate evaluation, what Polybius calls epistemen e gnomen atrake. While the writers of narrow histories have a subject that is simple and lacking variety, universal history has variety arising from its treatment of a multitude of theaters and events. Where universal history shows proportion in the narrative, the writers of monographs are compelled, because of the narrowness of the topic, to engage in all sorts of exaggerations in their attempts to make small things great. It is, in short, a better image of life, as Polybius, Polybius makes clear in, in his comparison of the monographic writer with one who sees the severed limbs of an animal, an, an animal while the universal historian presents the living animal alive and whole. Polybius has a good deal to say about those historians who introduce marvelous or tragic elements into their works. The extended and well-known criticism of Philarchus mentions, among other failings, his penchant for always placing the frightening before the readers' eyes. Writers on Hannibal's crossing of the Alps introduce gods and heroes to escort the Carthaginian general and provide him with a dramatic deliverance. So too, historians of Hieronymus of Syracuse have narrated his fall with the marvelous and the tragic, as have the writers of Agathocles uh, uh, of Alexandria. Tim Timaeus filled his work with dreams and mythoi. In all these writers, this use of the sensational is caused by the historians' failure to understand the proper purpose of history. Whereas tragedy is designed to thrill and charm an audience for the moment, history is to teach and persuade through truthful deeds and words. That marvelous or tra tragic material is useless for a history designed to teach is even clearer from a later passage where Polybius explains why such matters must be used why such matter must be used sparingly. The sensational, he says, attracts us only on first examination, but contributes neither to improvement nor pleasure. Things contrary to nature and the general sentiment of mankind do not provide permanent pleasure, and abnormal reversals of fortune do not arouse emulation. Therefore, it is clear that Polybius's aversion to these types of incidents arises from their inability to contribute anything practical. Being odd, they are not predictable or typical, and so do not fall into the category of events, of events from which men can learn. 
Partiality is also a failing that comes in for censure. Polybius allows that a good man will support his country and champion her cause. But once he becomes a historian, he must apportion praise and blame as they are deserved. And he must often criticize a friend and praise an enemy. His support for his country must not lead to a distortion of history, as it did for Fabius Pictor, the first historian of Rome, and Felinus, who behaved like lovers, ignoring all of their country's faults and mistakes and defending them no matter the cost. Zeno and Antisthenes were so patriotic towards their native roads that they proclaimed a Rhodian defeat a victory. A different kind of partiality is found in Timaeus, where he praised his native Sicily out of all proportion to its merits, saying that the wisest men and the most capable leaders came from there. He also lauded the tyrant Timoleon to the sky, although he censured Callisthenes for exalting Alexander. Indeed, the criticisms that Polybius makes of others were so, uh, were so many and so great that they can be explained only by uh, that these 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 uh, deficits can only be explained by a deficiency of character and an inveterate, inveterate bitterness. The issue of impartiality was of paramount importance in ancient discussions on the writing of history, and bias is again and again flagged as the greatest enemy of truth. Partiality led to exaggeration and wholesale invention, or conversely, to omission of honorable or noble actions. Uh, and, it is, and therefore, like the sensational, bias lessened historians uh, or history's utility. Given its import, its prominence elsewhere, one might have expected more on this idea of bias um, in Polybius. Its absence might be explained biographically, that is, by Polybius's own notorious partisanship in the case of Aetolia and Achaea. However, I suspect that for Polybius, this failing, at least in its positive form of praise for one's country, was more pardonable since it arose from good motives that were intimately connected with history. More than once, Polybius makes it clear that history is to exhort people to keep their obligations towards their own. Another reason may be that Polybius decided to spend most of his effort in the area in which he felt he really had exceeded his predecessors. That area can be broadly defined as experience, I think. The demand for which is Polybius's real innovation in historiographical thinking. In no previous or successive author does it loom so large. And we may certainly assume that Polybius has constructed his ideal historian, as Cicero was later to construct his ideal orator, with himself firmly in mind. He was not, of course, the first historian to have had a public career, nor the first to be in exile, nor the first to have an interest in geography or other practical matters. What he was, though, or what he presented himself to be, was one who combined all of these traits in ways not seen before. The historian's experience springs from several sources and conversely reaches into many areas. There is much that a historian needs to know and acquire by learning and training and he must demonstrate a suitable character, which will have been formed, of course, in its upbringing, in, in, in his own upbringing. Let us begin with inquiry, a fundamental aspect of historiogra historiography from Herodotus onward. Polybius clearly believes that this is an essential aspect of the historian's work. He frequently criticizes his predecessors for ignorance, the simple failure to find out what is there to be discovered. Earlier writers on the Roman palatea, or governmental institution, um, or on Rome's relations with Carthage, uh, Timaeus on the areas uh, around the Po, writers on Hannibal, or Zeno and Antisthenes's geographical era, these all uh, are aspects that Polybius criticizes his predecessors for having ignorance of, because they simply failed to find out what the truth was about these matters. And this type of avoidable ignorance is often the result of carelessness or an absence of effort, the historian of this type lacking the energy needed to find things out for himself. Sometimes this ignorance is the result of a failure on the part of the historian to inspect the various sites that his history demands. Ephorus and Theopompus wrote 
incomprehensible battle narratives because they had not troubled to see the places for themselves. Timaeus, for all his learning, too, often made careless, random, or poor inquiry, Polybius says. He relied on his ears rather than his eyes. On the other hand, Polybius constantly emphasizes his own personal observation, his own travels, uh, and his own avoidance of the tendency to write without care or from the first source that simply came along. To this extent, Polybius follows the general historiographical views before him. One thinks of Thucydides, for instance, who talks about this exactly, or even Herodotus, who um, oftentimes uh, contrasts uh, and, 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 and states when he has multiple sources on things. Where Polybius breaks, however, with his predecessors is in his insistence that inquiry by itself is insufficient if it is not guided by the experience that comes from a man of affairs. The experienced man is superior even here because he has, he not only inquires of eyewitnesses, but he also knows how to question them and can see what they might be leaving out or exaggerating. For Polybius, the best historian is thus one who combines both inquiry and experience, the proper training and the proper temperament. His ideal is an updated version of the Homeric hero Odysseus, and he praises the Homeric hero for his efforts to find things out as well as for his ability that comes from experience. This comes uh, across most clearly in Polybius's condemnation of Timaeus, where Polybius distinguishes between hearing and sight, the two organs of learning, of course. And he says that Timaeus took the easier but inferior road of research in the library rather than in travel and actual participation. This latter is, quote, very important and is the greatest part of history, says, Lucidity, uh, says Polybius, as is clear both from earlier historians, and he names Ephorus and Theopompus, and also even from Homer himself, who fashioned in Odysseus the man of travel and experience, the best paradigm for the successful historian. Since Polybius elsewhere says that Timaeus had a, quote, talent for detailed research and a competence based on inquiry, end quote, it is clear that his failure to achieve something worthwhile was a direct result of his lack of personal experience, his autopathia. Polybius had divided pragmatic history into three parts. <clears throat> One, the study and comparison of literary sources. Two, personal survey of various lands, uh, com which, compri which comprised uh, the history uh, that he was uh, writing about. And three, political experience. This is all delineated in the fragments of Book 12, 25E, 1 through 7. This last part, that is, political experience, is far and away the most important for Polybius, since only with personal experience can a historian produce what in Greek is called emphasis, or validity, the validity needed for a pragmatic history. The more experiences, the better equipped the writer is to deal with the full range of possibilities presented by his history, and the more likely that he will have his eye trained on what is most important. The man of affairs will also, because of his experience, know how to form proper judgments of, on men and events, whether it be in the evaluation of character or the role of larger forces, such as fortune and history. Speaking of the writers on Hieronymus's fall, Polybius says that they failed through lack of judgment, that is, diacresian, to see that little was to be gained by such narration and they might have put the space in their work to better use by treating the deeds of Hero or Gelon. This he says in Book 7, 7, 6 through 8. Conversely, writers on Scipio Africanus, quote, either through a lack of natural ability or from inexperience and laziness, dia fauloteta fuseos e de aparian kai ratumian, they do not understand what portion of success is owed to the gods or fortune and what part to calculation and foresight, and thus they fail to appreciate properly the greatness of the man. Of course, it is legitimate to ask to what extent Polybius followed his own precepts, just as Polybius had examined Timaeus and others based on what they said. Not surprisingly, he can exhibit the same faults as they do. 
It is clear, for instance, that Polybius could not treat events in the tragic fashion he claims to disdain. I'm sorry, that he could treat events in the tragic fashion that he claims to disdain. Um, his partiality for Achaea and his hatred of the Aetolians is palpable on nearly every page of his narrative. He who criticized Theopompus for organizing his history around a single figure, single figure that of Philip, came dangerously close to, to doing the same thing with his own exploits in the final books. Yet all of this is somewhat beside the point. It is true that Polybius's attack on Timaeus was motivated by a sense of competition and rivalry, by a need to be better than the established historian of the West. We lose sight of an essential element, however, when we forget that in societies based around competition like ancient Greece, Performance counted for a great deal, and Polybius's tract against Timaeus was indeed a prodigious display piece. Nevertheless, there is every reason to believe that much of what Polybius said he sincerely felt, or, to put it another way, his history attempts on every page to validate his beliefs about the proper way to write history, about its nature and purpose. Above all, he wished to leave a record behind that was comprehensive and accurate, that was useful and conducive to learning. No historian before him so clearly articulated what kinds of things could be learned from history, and be it said, what could not, um, and what skills and characteristics were needed to be a successful man of affairs, a pragmatikos aner. He was well aware that he wrote at a time when political participation, at least by the Greeks, was becoming less pronounced. That is perhaps one reason why he hopes Romans will read his work. But more to the point was the fact that diminished participation was not the same as complete inactivity, as Polybius' own later career showed. He was, after all, a survivor, one who had quite pragmatically achieved something for himself and his country, and certainly others might follow his example and do the same. And in writing for the future, which he reminds us is history's particular task, he must surely have been aware that fortune had raised and dashed the hopes of many empires before Rome. At some future time, the man of affairs might again be in demand in Greece, and at that point, everything he needed to know would be at hand in Polybius's record of the past. As with every aspect of Polybius's work, the examination of themes is hampered by the loss of substantial parts of the histories. We do not possess the major part of the story, the part that was in fact the theme of the histories, how Rome rose and ruled, and without that essential material, any summary of themes is bound to be skewed and incomplete. What assists us, however, in overcoming this deficit, somewhat slightly, is Polybius' own manner of narration, in particular his didactic remarks sprinkled throughout his text, even in the fragmentary parts. Unless it is purely the result of accident, the excerpts show everywhere that the same few themes found expression in all of the books, just as it is also clear that Polybius thought his main task was to teach by exemplar. It is often said that Polybius is neither an original nor a profound thinker, but rather very much a creature of his class with the beliefs and prejudices thereof. Yet this is in some sense, to measure the work by what it is not, rather than what it is. But the historian's observations and method are hardly unimpressive, and the achievement of the histories taken as a whole is by no means negligible. The word had changed a the world had changed a great deal since the late fifth century, no more so than in the constant presence of some great power, such as Persia, Macedon, and then Rome with which the Greek states and the leagues had to contend. It was as useless and senseless to try to write like Thucydides as it was to try to acquire an empire like that of the Athenians. So it is essential to recognize this changed world if we are to make sense of the disposition of Polybius's history and of the few themes to which he hearkens again and again. Polybius's world is that of smaller, smaller competing powers vying for influence with one another and dealing with the greater powers. The Greek leagues took now, the Greek leagues looked now to Macedon and then to Rome, 
and they always tried to decide under whose aegis they would fare better. Not surprisingly, therefore, Polybius devoted great effort to studying this dynamic relationship between unequal partners. The detailed accounts of debates and negotiations are the outward manifestation of this predominant interest. Polybius was greatly interested in and thought particularly valuable for his later readers what made for pragmatic success in the world, but also, as Arthur Eckstein's excellent book has made abundantly clear on Polybius, uh, he also was taking great pains to understand how to reconcile pragmatic success with honorable conduct. How one defined a successful man or state might be said to be a late motif of the histories as a whole. And this success could not be measured simply by the acquisition of hegemony or any other thing, however admirable such achievement might be. Two perspectives on this important theme are provided by the comparison between Philippimen and Aristinus over the proper response to Rome. Aristinus notes that all policies aim for honor and interest, and that if it is possible, it is always right to strive for the former. If not, one must be satisfied with achieving the latter. This he says in Book 24, 12, 2. Uh, and so the Achaeans should, quote, do what was agreeable to the Romans, sometimes even anticipating their orders. Book 24, 11, 14. I'm sorry, 11, 4. Philippimen made the case that a stronger power, quote, is always naturally disposed to press harder on those who submit to it. And if the Achaeans simply submit without argument, there would be no difference between them and the people of Sicily or Capua, who had long been the acknowledged slaves of Rome. This is a quote from Book 24, 13, 2 through 4. Polybius describes the policy of both men as safe since both attempted to protect the rights of Achaea in the face of Roman might, while in no way counseling useless antagonism of the ruling power. Contrasted strongly with such pragmatic policy is the attitude of those who would play the sycophant and in so doing make the rule of the hegemonic power harsher. This seems to be the gist of Polybius's harsh criticism of Callicrates, who fawns upon the Romans and encourages them to reward only those who follow their commands without delay or question, Book 24, 9, 1 through 10. For Polybius, this was a decisive moment in Roman relations with Greece, a point he underscores by invoking the beginning of evils motif. After his speech, Callicrates returned to Greece, not knowing that he had been the initiator of great evils for all the Greeks, especially the Achaeans. This is in um, uh, Book 24, 10, 8. It was from this time, Polybius says, that the Senate began the policy of weakening those who worked for the best in the various states and instead strengthened those who followed their orders. In the end, the Romans had many flatterers but few friends, and Callicrates's error was to contribute to strengthening an unbreakable hegemony. As one might expect, the issue of Polybius's view of Rome, once he had once Rome had achieved hegemony, was uh, uh, has been very much discussed by scholars. Polybius says explicitly that his added books are precisely to judge how the Romans ruled, since this is an integral aspect of those who have one empire, and something that students of history will need to know. The problem, of course, is complicated by the fragmentary nature of the last books on which the reader was to have based his judgment. Scholars have concluded very different things, from warm support to barely concealed contempt. Indeed, without the context, it is extremely difficult to be certain. Nevertheless, the portrait of Rome does not seem to be favorable. Polybius, in one place, suggests that the Romans use disputes between rival contenders for their own benefit. This is in Book 31, 10, 7. Although it is impossible from the context to say whether this is critical, uh, when it is read together with other passages, the sense is of a ruling state that seeks only to advance its own interests. For instance, when Demetrius of Syria asked the Senate to be sent home after more than 20 years as a hostage, Polybius states boldly 
that despite their personal affection for the boy and despite the justness of his cause, they arranged matters in a way more beneficial to themselves. Similarly, he remarks that the Carthaginian embassies to Rome always failed in their aims, quote, not because they did not have right on their side, but because the judges were convinced that it was in their own interest to decide against them. Book 31, 21, 5 through 6. There is also a sense of breakdown in the moral standing of the Romans. Polybius suggests that after the war with Perseus, Greek laxity had come to Rome. And after the dissolution of the Macedonian kingdom, vast amounts of wealth flooded into the city, with the result that the young men there gave themselves up to every kind of pleasure, the love of money, and the avoidance of military service. The portrait of Rome that emerges seems to have been far from complimentary. Perhaps then Rome was already on the decline from the pinnacle of her fortune. That fortune, Tuche, is always in motion, is clear from Polybius, and it forms one of his most important and pervasive themes. Tuche, fortune, has several meanings in Polybius, ranging from the non-causative chance to the full-blown director of men's affairs. Fortune, we might say, with a capital F. It is in the latter guise that she makes her first appearance as the one who has brought all affairs in the oikumene to one point, that is, Rome. This is Tuche personified, as Wallbank has shown, um, and is reserved mainly for events that are sensational or capricious, often disasters. Her power resides outside the world of reason and planning. Floods, drought, and plague may justifiably be referred to her workings, since the causes cannot be found among men and do not admit of reason. Where human and rational causes can be determined, however, there is no need to invoke chance. With that said, though, there is nevertheless quite often in Polybius a tension between human planning and the results, much as we have already seen with Thucydides and the historian, um, says Polybius, must deal with both because both are aspects of human life and action. Fortune often acts on the grand scale, as she did with Rome, or when bringing retribution upon those who have committed wicked deeds, as with Philip V. Yet in other cases, fortune seems to have no particular predisposition to achieving a desired end. Reversals of fortune fall upon all human beings, regardless of their moral excellence or baseness. Hence, here Polybius adverts to a theme already visible in Herodotus, the dangers attendant upon good fortune. He echoes Herodotus's Solon by observing that Tuche is apt to envy men, and she shows her power particularly where one thinks that one is especially fortunate and successful in life. What Herodotus ascribed to the god, however, Polybius assigns to Tuche, chance. And this Tuche is difficult to explain, since the causes cannot be found among men. But rather, it is as if some cosmic process is at work, on which one can rely to make consistent appearances, even if one can never exactly predict where and when she will strike. Even if Polybius's use of Tuche is at times clumsy, his history would have been the poorer without it. It fills in the picture, so to speak, that is only partially sketched by the more rational world of experience, planning, reason. And as in epic poetry, so in Polybius's great predecessors also, it lends uh, to human actions both a poignancy and a heroism. More explicitly than any predecessor, however, Polybius suggests that the only remedy for this aspect of human life is to be found in one's character. That is why his work is filled with evaluations of character on a scale not seen before. However, these are not disembodied observations, but rather are integrated into the actions of the narrative. And in this sense, they resemble that interplay of character and action so fascinating to Thucydides. To begin with, there is no doubt that Polybius saw the delineation of character as one of his chief tasks. He notes in particular that the training and character of men who direct affairs is more profitable than a discussion of the foundation of cities, precisely because it assists one in emulating great men and works directly for the improvement of the reader. 
As with the workings of chance, however, Polybius sees human character as complex. There is, he says, something multiform, the polyedes, in the nature not only of men's bodies, but also their souls. Individuals have various responses to things and may even exhibit differences in similar actions. For example, some are good at single combat, but not at fighting together in the line. For the historian, this results in the need sometimes to praise and blame the same person, depending on whether he is exhibiting strength or weakness. The consistency with which Polybius mentions this suggests that it may have been usual in historiography before him to exhibit the same attitude towards individuals throughout his work and to assign a fixed character to the historical actors in one's narrative. Yet it is not only, or indeed even primarily, the influence of chance that is paramount in men's conduct. To the contrary, men are influenced above all by circumstances and by the people with whom they associate. Such dynamic relationships make it difficult for the historian to pronounce with certainty on individuals. Polybius, for instance, wonders about Hannibal's true nature and whether it can be ascertained from his actions during his time in Italy, since he was then under the most difficult circumstances, particularly when the cities of southern Italy began to defect. And this compelled him, like many others, to behave sometimes in a less than straightforward manner. He also associated with unworthy people who incited him to do many harsh things. So too Philip, whose nature changed according to circumstances, yielding to which men are prevented from saying or writing their real opinions, he says. That is, Polybius says. Elsewhere, Polybius notes that the choice of friends is of decisive importance for a leader, and the success or failure of one's enterprise depends upon it. This he says in Book 7, 14, 6. So Philip's reversal, like that of Hannibal, was caused by circumstances and the bad advice of friends, which led Philip to do horrendous deeds that cried out for retribution. Now, to be sure, none of this is completely new with Polybius. The emphasis on the importance of circumstances and the associates in uh, and one's associates in the changing of character goes back, for instance, to the Stoic philosophers. And the importance of particularly a king's associates was a common theme in Hellenistic literature. What is important in Polybius, though, is that this recognition gave him a more nuanced approach to the character of the actors in his history, and a correspondingly greater independence of judgment in moving beyond simple praise and blame in the analysis of their lives and actions. Thucydides' portraits of Pericles and Cleon, by contrast, are notable for their static quality, and neither emerges fully as an individual in his own right. With Polybius, by contrast, there is a dynamic interplay between the character and the people and activities around him, such that the same historical actor can display a different character depending on the circumstances. For Polybius, it is the very power of fortune that compels us to look elsewhere for something fixed, and Polybius finds it paradoxically in character, even though he considers this a changeable thing. More precisely, we might say he believes that the interplay of character and circumstance allows for the soundest basis for judgment of historical actors. In Book 6, for instance, in the course of his discussion on the Roman Constitution, he notes that the true test of character and the method by which it is best judged is an examination of it in either extreme, in either extreme of fortune, when individuals are, quote, afflicted with adversity or blessed with success deeming the whole the sole test of a perfect man to be the power of bearing high-mindedly megalopsukos and bravely the most complete reversals of fortune. This is book six, two, five through six. Here then uh, are, are uh, familiar Homeric themes in a new guise. War as the great testing ground, adversity as the crucible in which virtue shines. The mutability of fortune demands that men show bravery and nobility when she confronts them, for she afflicts all alike. Even Polybius' hero Philippemon ended his days as the victim of fortune, captured by his enemies and dying ignominiously. One of the ways to manage fortune is to show moderation and success, for victory can be surely followed by defeat just as the other way around. 
the figure the figure of uh, Hannibal in this uh, light is very instructive. In his conference with Africanus, that is Scipio Africanus, before the Battle of Zama, we see the clearest indication of just this idea. There, Hannibal uses himself as an exemplum of the mutability of fortune. Nothing um, can be taken for granted. You can never trust fortune. He notes that he had once been master of Italy and was now compelled to fight for the survival of his own land. Warning that but a slight turn was needed to change the balance of fortune, Hannibal counsels Scipio not to be proud, but to think like a man and to settle the matter without hazarding all on chance. The viewpoint stated here is expressly endorsed later in the narrative in a passage which not coincidentally ties such understanding to the larger purposes of the history as a whole. He says it is chiefly at those moments when we ourselves or our country are most successful that we should reflect on the opposite extremity of fortune. For only thus and then, with difficulty, will we prove moderate in the season of prosperity. The difference between foolish and wise men lies in this, that the former are schooled by their own misfortunes and the latter by those of others. The remarks of the, uh, of the, uh, are those of Aemilius Paulus, made after his conquest of Perseus, and using Perseus himself as an exemplum of the truth of the words. This scene in itself sums up a great number of Polybian themes. Paulus shows moderation in good fortune and success, and exhibits self-control in the face of the overwhelming temptations of Macedonian wealth. And Paulus shows himself a historian as well, since he extols here the very same principles that Polybius had emphasized at the outset of his work. In the later books, pa Paulus's role seems to have been taken up by his adopted son, Scipio Emilianus. But with both men, it is clear that they are the exceptions to their contemporaries, not the rule. It is their character rather than any hegemony or empire that wins through the end. At the fall of Carthage, Aemilius, Aemilianus's recognition of the fragility of any empire or any good fortune is what makes him, like his adoptive father, quote, a great and perfect man, a man, in short, worthy of remembrance. This is Polybius 38, 21, 3. Against the backdrop of a large and competing set of powers and faced with a world of dark and incompletely understood forces, the desire to behave pragmatically and nobly was, in the end, all that a man had. Polybius was, as Arnaldo Mamiliano, one of the greatest uh, scholars of ancient historiography of the 20th century, put it, Polybius was born, quote, too late to be a classic and too early to be a classicist. <laughs> um, and this captures Polybius's later fate nicely. Eschewing literary polish, Polybius never entered the ranks of the first-rate historians in antiquity, although in this, as in other genres, the early formation of the canon made it difficult for any later historian to do so. The rejection of Hellenistic writing by the Atticizing movement of antiqui later antiquity did not help, nor did Polybius's simple and repetitive style. Even so, one can certainly see the influence of at least his methodological pronouncements and viewpoints in writers such as Diodorus Siculus, however that later historian may have adapted them, and Dionysius of Halicarnassus, despite his biting remark that no one read Polybius through to the end. Um, they clearly recognize the standing and authority of their predecessor, um, and that is particularly the case with Dionysius, uh, who ends his work, the Roman Antiquities, precisely at the point where Polybius's history begins. What the Greeks failed to appreciate fully was left to the Romans. It is ironic that although Polybius saw himself as writing primarily for Greeks, it was the Romans who always accorded him the highest honor. A list of Latin writers who respected and used him would include Cato the Elder, Sempronius Aicelio, Varro, Cornelius Nepos, of course, the great Cicero, and the historian Livy. Brutus wrote an epitome of his history. Pliny the Elder cites him often and praises him for his travels. Later in time, Ammianus Marcellinus, 
the last of the great Roman historians, found much to imitate from Polybius. The Byzantine historians Procopius and Agathius also show signs of Polybian influence, as does Zosimus, although how deeply the influence runs is questionable. A not unimpressive list, therefore, of admirers, and certainly enough to demonstrate that even if he never achieved the first rank of historians, he also never ceased to disturb, to stimulate, and to inspire. Thank you.